Uh, so hello everyone. I think we can get started now. Uh, welcome to the National Student Loans Workshop. Uh, to begin, I'd like to go over the land acknowledgement. So Toronto is in the Dish with One Spoon territory. Uh, the Dish with One Spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans, and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. So I know that we are all joining from different places, so you can look up the land that you are on and the treaties for that territory using www.nativeland.ca. Um, and also all the links that I am mentioning are going to be in the chat box. Uh, so it'd be a good idea to take a look at those links. Um, so I'd also like to introduce myself. Um, hello everyone, my name is Jazdeep. I'm currently the part-time, sorry, the member at large director at CSER. Um, you may be wondering what CSER is. Uh, CSER is the part-time and continuing education student union at Ryerson University. Uh, we represent students through uh, advocacy and campaigns, but we also run events uh, just like this one and services that make the student experience better. Uh, I'd like to introduce our great speakers that we have here today. Uh, so our first speaker is Patty Facey. Uh, she's an organizer and founder of the hashtag freeze the NSLSC campaign. Uh, Patty completed a master of information degree from U of T in 2020, uh, where she was deeply involved in community advocacy and student organizing as a UT GSU council member uh, and president of the U of T uh, master of information student uh, society. Uh, beyond organizing, Patty is a UX slash service designer with a particular interest in projects centered around civic engagement. Our next speaker is Nicole Briannis, who is the deputy chairperson of the Canadian Federation of Students and a free education activist. Uh, prior to being elected to the Federation, Nicole was actually the president of the Continuing Education Student Association of Ryerson. Uh, so now I will pass it over to uh, Patty to get started on the discussion of student loans. Well, thanks, Jazdeep. Okay, let me just share a screen for you all. Um, okay, I assume you guys can see. So basically my idea is um, I'm, I wanted to give you guys all a little bit of a primer maybe about how student loans work in Canada in general and then how the NSLSC is involved and then also recap everyone on the timeline of this freeze the NSLSC campaign and what it means for soon to be grads. So. For Canadians, um, loans are paid in part by students' home provinces, as well as the federal government, and how you pay back as, after graduation, as well as um, what it costs you in the long run will depend on your home province. So once you graduate, there's a six-month grace period where you don't have to make payments on the federal portion of your loan. Um, usually some provinces, some provinces also follow this grace period, not all. Um, and during the grace period, there's no interest charged on that Canada portion of your loan. Again, it depends on your province for some interest starts accruing right after you finish a program. Um, and I know it's a bit different for part-time students too. I think for some provinces, you don't get in interest-free status as a part-time student. Um, I've seen that some individuals have to start making payments while they're still in, in school. So I know that the burden is a bit different too for part-time students. So how you repay, of course, also depends on your provinces. Some provinces have this integrated loan system where both the provincial and federal portions of your loan are paid together in payments to the NSLSC. Um, if it's not integrated, it means part of your loan is repaid to the NSLSC and then part back to the province or to the other entity where you got your loan. So the NSLSC is um, something that everyone has to deal with at some point after graduation if you've taken out loans. So ordinarily what happens is, you know, you, you, you finish your program, you find work, you start to gain a little bit of financial stability, and then months down the line, um, you start making your payments, which can be adjusted based on your income and on how aggressive you want to be in paying your loan down. And those payments either go entirely or in part to the NSLSC. Um, and this changed a little bit with COVID. So in March, you might all know, there was a six month freeze announced on Canada student loan payments and interest. So from March up until the end of September, anyone who was already in the process of repaying their loans, so who had graduated in 2019 or earlier, um, received this freeze. And for 2020 grads, this freeze overlapped with the grace periods that I just mentioned. So no extra freeze was given to 2020 grads after the fact. So 2020 grads did not actually benefit from that COVID-19 freeze. Um, and then the COVID freeze ended one month before the class of 2020 grace period, if you were a spring grad. Um, and the reason I bring this up is because 
that's where the origins of this freeze, the NSLSC campaign actually began. So initially it was a call um, for 2020 grads who graduated right at the, the height of the first wave of lockdown. So this parliamentary petition um, was put together to address the fact that 2020 grads were dealt quite an unfortunate set of post-grad circumstances finishing when they did. So these are some stats that are in the petition. Um, you know, students and, and recent grads were among the first group of people to be laid off um, in part-time positions, um, in upcoming summer contracts, or in uh, uh, situations where students had landed full-time work post-grad, but their contracts were, were taken away. So um, at the same time, the youth unemployment raise, uh, rate tripled, and it was much higher than the um, unemployment rate for those that are age 25 older. Um, there were projections about the losses that the class of 2020 might endure over the next few years if the market doesn't recover. And then in general too, one in two Canadian students, half will graduate with student loan debt. And the average depends on your program. Um, it'll, it'll range from 14,000 to 26,000. So at the time, this was um, early fall, we expected that this broad loan freeze would be extended for everyone, which is why we were so focused on support for new grads. And once it became clear that this was not going to happen, we pivoted to focus um, not just on 2020 grads, but on all loan borrowers. So while we still think that new and, and recent grads have been overlooked in many ways in the COVID-19 response, um, it really doesn't make sense to be burdening Canadians with loan payments when people are, are continuing to be laid off and are working reduced hours. So why freeze the NSLC? Um, in large part because without an extended freeze on payments and interest, the only option for those who cannot repay their loan or are struggling to do so is to apply for something called the Repayment Assistance Plan. Um, and over the last few months, I'm sure you've heard news stories about the issues that have um, riddled the NSLSC's RAP. So you apply online for the NSLS, on the NSLSC for the RAP, massive surge in applications in the fall after the, the first freeze ended. Initially, applicants that applied early fall were told they would get a response no later than October 31st. By December, many people still hadn't heard a thing. Uh, many people then tried phoning the NSLSC because that's the only way to contact them. But the call volume was so high that people were waiting on hold for more than two hours or um, in some cases couldn't even be put on hold because the hold queue had filled up. Um, and it was around this time that the media started reporting that there had been 169,000 applications between October 1st and the end of November for this repayment assistance program. And at that point, by early December, there were still 30,000 applications that had not been processed. And then in the meantime, um, people were still reporting that they were being charged payments, despite the fact that anyone that applies for the REP um, is not supposed to be charged payments while their applications in review. It says this on the NSLSC's website. Um, and another factor too is that the repayment threshold you have to meet with RAP um, is quite low. So anyone that makes less than $25,000 um, gross income doesn't have to make their loan payments, but this is still quite low considering the cost of living in this country. And it's an issue for anyone that might have seen a major reduction in their hours or have been laid off, but still managed to be making over $25,000 and have other um, expenses that they need to be making, right? So for a lot of people, half of that could go to rent alone. So a lot of our campaign so far has been focused on raising awareness about the impacts of not extending the freeze on Twitter and social media. And um, a major development for us was this motion that um, came to the House of Commons late November. So after tweeting and social media blasts about our petition and the uh, CFS petition as well, uh, on November 24th, NDP MP Heather McPherson moved this motion to extend the freeze for an additional six months and it passed unanimously. So at that point, everyone thought, fantastic, we did it, we'll have more time. But this was uh, a bit of false hope because a few days later, loan borrowers got this email saying that actually payments were not frozen and despite recent media reports, you will still be charged. And then a few days after that, um, the fall economic statement was released and it made no mention of a freeze at all. Um, the only relief measure was a uh, pause on interest from 2021 to 2022, but it didn't state when that starts. Is it like the fiscal year of, of April 2021 to March 2022? And it doesn't seem that it's actually started yet. 
And since then, there's been no word from our prime minister, um, our employment minister, the youth minister, any other cabinet members. So it's it's like the the unanimous motion never happened. So what now? Um, the only option as we see it is to follow through and freeze the NSLSC. Um, people's income is still significantly impacted by the pandemic. Student loan payments should not take precedence over living expenses right now. And if you search um, this hashtag or just NSLSC on Twitter, you encounter countless complaints from people that are struggling to make their payments or can't, can't access the uh, NSLSC's website, can't reach people on hold. Some people are claiming that their CERB um, and CRB and EI installments are going to their loan payments. Um, the NSLC also for most people is, is connected to direct deposit to your banking info. So for some payments, for, for some people payments are just deducted automatically and there's no control over when that happens. Um, and not making payments has a massive impact on credit. So this is really a very frustrating and precarious position to find yourself in right after finishing a post-secondary program. So, you know, the years that you spend in school are already a major investment of your time and your energy and your finances. And um, despite calls from our government about young people and students needing support, um, we don't really see how enforcing loan payments right now is a measure that actually supports new grads during the pandemic. So. In terms of supporting this whole campaign, what we hope people will be uh, moved to do is to tweet, share experiences on social media, write to your MP. I know there's templates in, uh, in our, on our social media and, and CFS has also, I think, put together sort of a petition or a, a sort of a form letter that you can adjust to um, send to your MP, signing our petitions. And um, even though this campaign really focuses on relief during the pandemic, I think it's also been a really good opportunity to think about the cost of education and, and the changes that we can make with or without the pandemic. So right now the call is freeze the NSLSC during COVID-19, but who knows, maybe, maybe we need to kind of like cryogenically freeze the NSLSC forever by like, you know, offering loan relief, um, forgiving loans. So I'm sure Nicole probably has more about that. So I'll let her sort of take it from here, but that's kind of a summary of um, what this campaign is and how it started and sort of where we're taking it next. Yeah, thanks so much, Patty. Um, I think you laid everything out um, perfectly. And um, yeah, I'm happy to try to bounce off of now and, and kind of build off of what you spoke about. Um, one thing that I'll mention uh, that you'd already prefaced a little bit too is that for part-time students, when it comes to loans, um, usually what takes place is that there's no pause on um, interest-free period. Like that's not something that's available to part-time students. Um, often when you are studying uh, in your courses, you don't necessarily have to make loan repayments uh, during those immediate studies. But as soon as that uh, those courses finish, uh, uh, that's when the interest starts to accrue. Um, so, you know, when we look at the pandemic now and how students have been impacted as well, we've seen many uh, full-time students have to drop down to part-time status just to be able to continue, uh, you know, manage those finances as well as other uh, external obligations that they have too. So um, it really is a, a really significant and um, a conversation that we need to be having right now about the lack of support that's being given on these loans uh, and the, you know, the ultimate impact that it has on folks upon graduation as well. So uh, another thing that I, I know you had talked about a little bit too is uh, the NSLSC itself uh, and the issues that students have been experiencing in terms of you know, wrongful charges to their accounts, uh, not being able to seek any support uh, from the offices themselves. Uh, we've had a number of students reach out to us as well prior to the uh, December break, as well as I actually just had a student reach out to me last week saying that this is still experiences that are ongoing. So um, there's clearly discrepancies in terms of the supports that are available to students um, and the expectations that are still there uh, to make these payments. So um, what we have heard that the NSLSC website has done uh, to try to rectify some of these situations situations is, uh, you know, they've implemented uh, live chat features on their websites uh, to operate during regular business hours to try to help relieve some of that pressure that's been on the phone lines. Um, they've also introduced things like emails, uh, uh, reminders about payments. But again, all of this ultimately just goes to show the prioritizations of where uh, money is still being spent within the government's respect and that they're focusing on loans being repaid rather than actual forms of relief that can be provided for individuals that is it, that's affecting everybody now on, you know, not only a financial basis and the ability to succeed uh, moving forward, but also, you know, the, the stress and the mental health impacts that these uh, overwhelming debt burdens have on individuals too. 
So these are really the conversations that we need members of government to be shifting towards having. Uh, and Patty mentioned, for example, the petition that you can sign right now, uh, the NS, uh, freeze the NSLSC has ongoing uh, to call for, um, you know, moratoriums to be reintroduced on federal loans. Um, the, uh, Patty also spoke about, you know, the vote that took place and the disappointment that students face by, you know, hearing that at the fall economic statement, this isn't something that was fulfilled by the acting government. Uh, so students really need to be the ones putting pressure and saying that, hey, like, we've been calling for support since back in April, you know, since uh, March of last year, and we're still waiting. That's still not something that's been achieved. And um, there's actually a petition that's coming to the floor uh, tomorrow that was previously signed by over 9,500 people within this country, calling for student relief, calling for every single student to be included in the Canada response benefit that's now uh, still ongoing, recognizing that the Canadian emergency student benefit it ended back at September 30th of 2020. So for the past, you know, uh, four months, students have had absolutely no relief available to them. Uh, as Patty mentioned, you know, even the pause on interest, uh, it's unclear when that's gonna be implemented. Uh, there's a lot of questions and there's a lot of, of miscommunication that's being done so that students are really being left behind throughout this pandemic. So a, a way that you can get involved too is a, again, um, we have an ongoing campaign that just launched last week called Education for All. Uh, it, it calls on the government to make immediate um, uh, relief measures for students as well. Uh, also looking towards, you know, not only just right now during the pandemic, but what does relief look like for students and a just recovery for students long term as well? Uh, one of these things is, you know, moving even beyond uh, asking for moratoriums and the freezer repayments, but calling for things like debt relief. We know that students uh, long term are going to need more support. And if we are going to be rebuilding this country together, especially post pandemic, we need everybody to be in a stable financial situation to be able to do so. And having these overarching and overwhelming debt loads is going to inhibit people to be able to engage in the economy and ultimately help rebuild this country together. So what we really need, you know, is a cross partisan approach to uh, uplifting people. Um, we've seen, you know, there's a lot of talk and, and Patty, I'm happy if you jump in the conversation now too about what we've been hearing from the states in terms of Biden coming into office. You know, we heard that eight hours in, he had already, you know, paused uh, interest, which is something that students had to fight for months for here and are still fighting for uh, to have reinstated. Um, there's talks from Biden that he's looking into um, debt relief uh, based on income, which is again, something that can be happening within this country and, and the conversations just aren't there. So students really need to be putting the pressure on now and showing our governments that we're not going away. You know, we're the largest voting population of young people within this country. We have the power, especially in light of what might be a federal election in the next couple of months to shape the decisions of this country. Uh, so we really need to be putting the pressure on and hitting, uh, hitting hot and heavy uh, to show that we deserve this belief and that we're not going to back down and getting it. I'll just point out something too. you know, um, some people, a lot of people forget about this, but just over a year ago when we were in the middle of an election, um, the, the Liberals actually campaigned on the promise of uh, increasing the uh, non-repayment period, the grace period, to, from six months to two years, um, and on raising the threshold for RAP payments, knowing that, of course, that income level of $25,000 is really, really, really low. So these are not things, these are not big asks. They're not really out of the ordinary. They are things that our government campaigned on doing. Um, and still nothing has happened. Non neither of those uh, campaign promises have been pursued. So, you know, it, yeah, I think that's just a, an important point to consider. These are not, these are not like totally out there asks. These are things that, we, that have already been discussed by all of the different parties. Um, and you raise a good point, Nicole, that it's really a cross-partisan issue. And in some ways it's quite surprising to see that, that none of the parties really have been um, talking about this there have been some tweets from of course the from NDP members like Heather McPherson who has been pushing for this loan freeze but at the at the larger more broader party scale um, it doesn't really seem like this this takes precedence um, over some of the other things that are being discussed during the pand pandemic so it's really on student groups I think and advocacy groups to push for that um, and to make noise about it until it's acknowledged 
Definitely. Yeah, that's a really great point. Um, and it, it comes down again to budgets are about priorities. Uh, it's been very evident where the priorities lie uh, throughout this pandemic. And, and I think this is uh, the kind of mindset that will continue again in moving beyond the pandemic and where money will continue to be invested long term. So we really need to be putting on that heavy pressure now to ensure that education is a central priority. Um, again, referencing back to this uh, petition um, that uh, is going to be read on the House of Commons floor tomorrow. Um, it was put forward by one of our other solidarity partners, Don't Forget Students, that Patty had mentioned earlier as well. Uh, it was sponsored by um, Honorable Laurel Collins as well. Um, but the calls within this petition is, you know, calling for that $900 million uh, from the, you know, failed We Charity program that was never properly reallocated, but was still owed to students. Um, the government has tried to shift that money now, about $450 million from it into the Canada Summer Jobs Program. But we know, you know, part-time students often are eligible for those positions. International students aren't eligible for those positions. Students over 30, not eligible for those positions. So, you know, who again is the government time and time again excluding from accessing any kind of relief measures? Um, and, you know, tying into that too, uh, within that petition, one of the final asks is working towards a 50-50 cost share in funding for post-secondary education uh, between the federal and the provincial levels uh, and territorial levels, that long-term there is that investment and prioritization within the post-secondary education sector so that students, again, aren't only going to receive minimal or, you know, whatever relief they're trying to patchwork together throughout the pandemic, but that we need serious and long-term investment in order to, you know, set a stable foundation for everybody to succeed moving forward. And we know that education is at the central foundation of that in, in rebuilding this country ultimately, but also making successful uh, and, you know, um, uh, successful and united uh, community as well within this uh, country. So, yeah. Sweet, so we're happy to answer any questions if there are any on the floor, but I'll pass it back to Jazz Deep too, unless Patty has anything uh, that you would like to add on. <laughs> no, not yet, I'm, I'm, I'll wait to see what people ask first. Uh, so if anyone has questions, uh, please use the chat box and then we can read the questions off the chat box. Uh, so the question is, how do we fix the NSLSC? Is this an administrator issue? Is it a legislative issue? And is there a reason we haven't seen the uproar as issues persist? I, I actually have a I have thoughts that come immediately to mind about this. So um, I th the way that I see the NSLSC right now, there's two issues and one relates to infrastructure and the other relates to policy. So and I think that's actually the way that the NSLSC, as I understand it, is set up. So the NSLSC, the administration of it is actually contracted out to um, a private company. Um, they from what I understand from reading online about them, they um, handle like the, the, the website or they, they administer the actual loan program, but the, the, the student loans are funded by the government. So if you actually try to use the NSLSC's website, it just feels sort of like a bad website. It's really difficult to navigate. It's really difficult to apply for things. Um, it's really difficult to find information. It's difficult to people encounter error messages all the time. People are signed out all the time. So there's one aspect of it that seems like, okay, this like as a website, as a, as a government sort of like system needs some attention. Um, especially, you know, the, the fact that there's, there's conflicting information about how you're charged, when you're charged, um, how you apply for the REP, how you qualify, the fact that you can only contact people by phoning them. Um, that's one major aspect of it um, that just sort of seems to be entirely um, focused around infrastructure and the fact that there's the infrastructure can't really support, it seems like, the needs of students and grads. Um, and then, of course, the whole other side of this is a policy matter, I think, of what is the NSLSC doing? It's, it ties into the broader question of um, should we, should we, what should we be doing with student loan debt? Um, in terms of why people we haven't really seen uproar about this, I think that a lot of it has to do with the fact that if you are not someone that relied on loans for your education, you are very disconnected from all of this. You won't have to ever think about the NSLSC. You won't really think about how um, loans are administered. You don't think about what it what it takes to pay it back. Um, I think based on the NSLSC's repayment tool, they they average the they let you um, decide over what time you want to pay your loan off and the average 
payment time seems to be 114 weeks, which is just, it's nine and a half years. So if you're somebody that does not, um, that you, that never took out loans for your education, none of this is, is coming to your mind at all. And you're probably thinking about um, other things that you think affect, let's say Canadians more broadly, like mortgage relief, business debt relief, et cetera. But for the young people, um, you know, half of Canadian students that are taking out loan debt, this has lifelong impacts for them. So students with loan debt are not probably thinking about their mortgage because they can't afford one. They're trying to pay off their loans. They're not thinking about starting businesses. And I'm speaking generally here because they're think they're they're working to pay off their loans. So I, there's it's a it's a problem of visibility, I think, in a lot of ways. If you if you don't if this is not a problem for you, you're just not thinking about it. So. I think that's a, a huge part of it. Maybe you have more to, to say, Nicole. I think you covered it really well. Um, the other side of that, I guess that I'll add to is that, you know, we look at who are the folks that have to take out the loans, like, and why they have to take out loans to begin with is because there's so many external factors uh, within their lives that require them, you know, to, to be in the place um, where they do need financial support to pursue these, uh, to pursue education. So uh, those external commitments or responsibilities don't stop when they finish their courses. So they actually have a lot on their plate too, where, um, you know, they definitely, I, I'm sure care about the advocacy initiatives, but initiatives, but sometimes they simply just don't have enough time to, to be the ones that are going after these, um, these different advocacy methods. So now is really where we're trying to create and like freeze the NLS LSD has been an excellent example of like having a movement to join into so that you don't feel like you're alone in this initiative either. Uh, and, and we always know like strength in numbers is the way to go. So um, really do if you're inspired and if you're feeling impacted by this too, like reach out to organizations like freeze the NLS LSD, like don't forget students, you know, Canadian Federation of Students is here to support you as well. And the more we band together and the more that we show that, that strength in numbers, the more that our voice is going to be amplified and the uh, and the more like we are to get change as well so uh, so there's another question in the chat box which is what should students be looking for from the platforms of federal parties going into a spring election that's a great question um i can start with this one and then patty feel free to jump in too um at this point, you know, any type of commitment to uh, investing in post-secondary education is a really great starting point. Um, also definitely should be looking uh, at relief measures that these parties are talking about for uh, for students specifically. Again, we know that largely students have been put on the back burner um, throughout conversations at the House of Commons. Uh, so we really need to see that when, you know, people are going to lay it all out there uh, during their uh, partying um, campaigning points. So uh, we need to see, you know, how many times a student referenced, uh, how many, you know, how much money are, are they saying that they're going to be investing in students as student relief? And what are their goals for the post-secondary education sector as a whole? Because again, uh, we need to be thinking even beyond this pandemic in terms of what long-term measures can we start investing in now that are going to set up students for a better future moving forward as well. So, you know, looking at things like, is there any measures for debt relief within there, um, you know, including students again within all of those support uh, measures throughout the pandemic uh, and actually investing and taking the time to care about uh, post-secondary education and working, you know, not just saying a hands-off approach where it's up to the provinces or the territories, how they operate these systems, but showing compassionate and care and wanting to be uh, integrated into those conversations and putting money into these sectors as well. I think you summed it up for me. I have nothing to add. <laughs> Uh, actually, one other thing I can think about too, um, uh, that if folks were able to join the food security panel earlier this week that Caesar was also a part of uh, in planning for that, um, is looking at things like a universal basic income is another really great point. Uh, because we know that as long as loans are still withstanding, still something that's uh, in place, there needs to be methods again in that ongoing investment to ensure that folks are going to be able to have uh, basic living incomes and be able to succeed in supporting themselves as well as paying off their uh, their loans uh, in the interim and working towards a loan free system of uh, post secondary education. So that's another measure that can be looked at. Uh, really taking a holistic approach, uh, like are there takes on food security within these uh, conversations as well? Because that's a really big area that is also often left out of these political party platform. So really thinking again, holistically and, and, um, and collaboratively in your mindset when you approach these uh, party platforms and knowing how to read between the lines about what parties are going to be ad advocating for and seeing how present at the forefront they care about these issues. Uh, so we have another question. I've heard the federal government and the prime minister talk about supporting young people a lot. Why hasn't the government acted meaningfully, especially during COVID, including forgiving student debt? 
who stands to gain from the way student debt is collected now? I don't, I, I almost, I, um, maybe one way of thinking about um, the, maybe government's reliance on student loan debt um, without, I don't wanna try to make claims because it, the, the way that the NSLSC and the Canada Student Loans Program is run is not super transparent. So I don't wanna make any false claims about this, but one thing to consider is it's really expensive to have this student loan program. So um, I mentioned that, you know, for example, the administration of the NSLSC is contracted out to a private company. Um, they have a contract to do this until 2026 and they receive tens of millions of dollars a year to administer the student loan program. And what they receive is um, dependent on how many students are, in re are registered or enrolled in the loan program and grants program. So there's a huge cost associated with actually running it. Um, and, you know, it was mentioned in a, um, in a, a committee meeting yesterday, a parliamentary committee meeting, um, MP uh, Matthew Green asked the parliamentary budget officer about um, the cost of forgiving student debt. And there was a figure thrown out that in the last five years, $2 billion, $2 billion worth of uh, student loan debt was forgiven um, due to financial hardship. So it's, it's expensive. <laughs> Um, and I don't really actually, I, I could not tell you what the perfect solution is right now, but it seems to, to be that it's not, there's so much tied up in the way that Canada Student Loan Program is run um, that sure, you know, uh, the, the government says, yes, we need to su support students, um, but it's not really clear on, on how uh, the cost of education ties into that for them um, when students talk about the fact that, you know, Tuition prices have increased over the last several decades. Public funding to universities has decreased. So overall, the cost of, of getting an education now is much more expensive than it was years ago. And if tuition is more expensive, the cost of attending school is more expensive, students rely more on loans. So it's sort of like, you know, a chicken and egg thing. And it, it, it's a cycle that keeps feeding each other. Um, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think you you nailed all the main points. Um, I'll do another plug for Caesar on your other events. Is check out the privatization of education panel where folks really delved into this issue pretty deeply. Um, and it, it's a big conversation to have, but exactly what Patty just said that it comes from like a chicken and egg thing where there's been a gradual defunding of post secondary education for a long time from one that was publicly funded to one that is now publicly assisted. Uh, and again, that prioritization of budget is really what it comes down to in that post secondary education is really taken about back burner um, and has now become uh, almost reliant on for you know all that interest that's accrued that's huge monetary gain for the government uh, to use in other places as well um, so we really need to be talking about how the funding measures are set up um, and how are we going to make post-secondary education a priority uh, moving forward beyond this pandemic as well uh, so what can we do to add to the what can we do to add the pressure ahead of a federal election? Is this just a student issue and should people outside of current students or recent graduates make this their issue? That's a great question. Um, so ahead of an election, I, I would say, you know, you can do things on your own personal social media. Uh, I know that like folks like at Freeze Dan SLSC and Don't Forget Students, uh, they're very active on Twitter and actually get a lot of engagement from members of parliament. Uh, and individuals get that too. So if you're really passionate about it from your own personal perspective, there's a lot of ways uh, in public formats to be able to get engaged. We also have things like email tool, uh, emailer tools uh, set up on our, our websites. If you go to the Education for All website, uh, there's emailer tools there. And in the CFS uh, uh, on our Instagram, um, we have a link tree uh, that's in our bio and that has really access easy to petitions on the CFS Ontario. Like there's many ways you can access email or tools as well to contact your members of parliament uh, and let them know that you want investment into post-secondary education. Um, so definitely stay up to date and you know follow our social medias for things like that too, because we're constantly trying to make new and creative ways for you to be able to engage in that capacity as well. Um, and then ultimately, I think another factor is when an election does become available, make sure that you are registered to vote. Uh, they will be noting the youth um, vote as well of folks who participate. And that's oftentimes when we go into conversations, an argument that they try to use as a cop out and saying that, you know, students uh, and young people in general aren't going out to vote, uh, which we know students do care about the issues. Oftentimes it's, it's deflating to see that our issues aren't being talked about on party platforms. So taking the time now to put call outs and say like, hey, we want to see ourselves reflected uh, in the conversations that
that are being had at the house, as well as if a, if an election is held, we, we want to see our issues at the forefront, but also making sure that when the time comes that we are, you know, getting out there voting and becoming active. Um, for international students who aren't able to engage in those processes, uh, do definitely engage still with, you know, uh, when petitions like on change.org, for example, that were launched by the Federation and, and don't forget students previously, um, when things like that are available, definitely do sign on, uh, do share the parliamentary petitions if you can with domestic students that um, you may have in your communities or in your networks, uh, and also still engage, like I said, with those email or tools and in your own personal networks, you're still able to write emails as well, uh, personally or externally, call offices, however it is that you're most comfortable or reach out to us too to find out more ways to get involved and we're more than happy to connect you to uh, the different networks uh, and get you more integrated too in the work that we're doing because we'd love to have you be a part of it. And I'll just I'll touch on the 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 uh, is this just a student issue or uh, should people outside of current students uh, or recent grads make this their issue? This is this is not just a problem for students and the a part of this is the fact that you know um, post-secondary education is the new high school education, right? Now it's expected that you're going to have a bachelor's degree or, or at least a, a college or a technical degree. Um, this is an expectation now that people need this um, extra education after high school to find good work and to be able to be members of our workforce and our economy. So this is not just uh, a niche group of people that are affected. This is an entire generation now of people who are investing extra time, extra money, um, into an education with the expectation that, well, this is what I need to basically establish a life for myself. Um, and a huge thing to think about is, you know, what impact does this have on our economy if you have an entire generation of people who are so riddled with debt, um, student debt and other forms of debt, if they can even afford it, um, what impact does this have on actually being like participants in our economy? Um, it, it has long-term impacts. And if, if every generation going forward is going to be saddled with like tens of thousands of dollars in some cases of student debt, what, is, what does that mean, right? Um, so I think, I think it's a bigger problem. It's not just a problem for the people that have loans. It, it, it's going to have, it seems like it can have impacts um, more broadly. So I believe we have one more question. Um, how do we talk about debt relief as tuition fee free education, but also how do we talk about debt relief for people who have already paid off student loans and feel like they were left out? I think Patty just touched on that pretty well uh, previously uh, in her answer as well. But again, the fact that everything is tied together. Um, you know, whether you're a business owner, whether you're somebody who, um, you know, whatever, not, whatever way that you wish to engage with the economy within our country, um, you rely on other people to be able to support the, the service it is that you're offering. So uh, the more money that's available for folks to use outside of debt, the more likely they are that they're able to support these different sectors as well. Um, so from a monetary perspective, everybody gains. Um, from another perspective, too, about feeling left out, you know, like, Again, it's setting yourselves and your and future generations up for uh, for success in the future. Um, also setting yourself up for success in the future. Like I remember, you know, at Chang School, there's many mature students who are returning to reskill themselves for the work that they're doing, uh, which is something Patty had touched on a little bit too. So just because you're done your undergraduate or your graduate degree, uh, maybe you're not, you know, fresh out of <laughs> fresh out of post secondary education anymore from your first time in. Uh, the likelihood is that, especially with such a quickly shifting uh, workforce and quickly adapting workforce with everything that's coming from climate change through technology of advancements, whatever it is, uh, we're a very fast paced world. And, um, you know, you're setting yourself up for the ability to be able to adapt it and succeed in these spaces too, without having to rely or worry about uh, the heavy burden that's going to be accrued alongside with that and keeping up with what's going. So, yeah. <laughs> and on top of that too, I touched on this earlier, right? But, but when you consider the fact that the cost of tuition and of education has increased so much over the, the past few decades, if people who may have paid their loans off 10, 20 years ago, probably did not have, they did not have the same amount of debt as students do now. Um, and there used to be a time, of course, like, you know, 20, 30 years ago, where we talk about the fact that you would just go and your, your summer job would be able to carry you through the year in terms of your tuition and your living expenses. And that people, I don't think um, young people can even fathom that being possible anymore. Um, so it's not just a matter of, well, I had to do it, so you did it too. It's not the same anymore. It's not the same amount of debt. Um, and the the it's not the same it doesn't take the same amount of time to to pay off anymore it's not paid off quickly it's paid off 
um, over a long period of time, like I said, for some people up to 10 years. Um, so when you, when, when folks, I think, um, fixate on the fact that I had to go through this so others should too. Like Nicole said, it takes away from the fact that maybe there's actually a systemic problem here that we need to to nip in the bud and not let progress any further. Great. So thank you, uh, Nicole and Patty for being here. Uh, we don't have any other questions uh, unless uh, we get any in the next few seconds. Um, but we were just wondering if you had any closing kind of remarks before we jump into our, our just information on, on upcoming events and, and a reminder to sign all the petitions you've mentioned. Well, I'll just say, um, you know, please follow Freeze the NSLSC on, we're on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. It's the same handle for all three. Um, if you feel confident doing so, please share your experiences about um, loan payments and the NSLSC with the hashtag. That is also our handle. Um, and uh, Nicole mentioned that the, the larger petition that had a broader ask for an extended freeze and more supports for students is closed already, um, but it'll be read tomorrow in the House of Commons. Nicole, I'm sure you'll mention that. Um, but we have a petition still that was targeted at the class of 2020. And even though now, like I mentioned, we've sort of moved beyond that, it sets a precedent for recognizing that the students that graduate during the pandemic have not received extra uh, loan freeze time or, or um, really many benefits at all. So if you maybe you did not graduate last year, but you will be graduating soon, please consider signing that petition. Um, and hopefully it will just set a precedent for recognizing that new grads have uh, very different struggles in many ways from, from students and from those who've already paid off their student loan debt. Uh, yeah, um, so the one thing like I wanna just come back around to is that you know throughout this pandemic, supposedly, although we're still looking for the receipts and we're still pressuring the government to make sure that they're actually upholding all the money that they claim they would be dedicating to students. Um, there was supposed to be about a $9.2 billion uh, plus investment into the student relief programs. Uh, and we know that from costing out over the years, it would just, it would be just over, you know, 10.5, $10.7 billion for post-secondary education to be publicly funded annually. Um, so there's lots of precedents uh, to set in, in making these commitments now that it's shown that there can be money there if the choice is made uh, and ensuring that post-secondary education is prioritized moving forward. Um, this really builds into the, the campaign launch that I mentioned earlier, um, Education for All. Uh, please do um, be sure uh, to sign up using the petition on the website um, to join the cause and you'll be joined onto the email or list to stay up to date with all the available resources and updates that are happening. Um, as Patty had just mentioned, there is that petition that's going to be read on the floor um, tomorrow uh, that had received over 9,500 signatures. So again, thank you to everyone uh, in Caesars Network who signed that as well. Um, as a note, uh, the, the House will have about three months to respond. Uh, so we really need to put the pressure on uh, from now until March 12th, I think is the deadline for that, of which the vote can be held about how to proceed forward on the asks that are being raised. Um, so do stay involved and engaged and help amplify those those messages so that you know we do see a result that is in the favor of our students uh, and that we don't let them back out this time if they pass something on the floor. Uh, we don't want a repeat of the fall economic statements. So students need to be at the forefront being loud, making noise and showing that, hey, we deserve this relief and that we're not going to stop until we get it. Um, yeah, please do follow the Canadian Federation of Students. Uh, again, we're also on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, you can find our handle at CFSFCEE. -E. Um, and yeah, please do follow, stay up to date with all that good stuff. Uh, and looking forward to connecting with you folks and working together more and fighting for free education together. Great, so a big thank you to our speakers, Patty Facey and Nicole Briannis for their valuable contributions, especially regarding the important dialogue of current student debt and current legislation. Um, so again, please do stay involved and engaged and please take a look at the petitions. They are all um, available in the chat box. Uh, if you wanna keep talking, um, if you wanna keep talking about reducing barriers to education and working together to make tuition free for all students, uh, please come to the equity and campaigns committee meeting. Uh, to get involved, please email maddie at vp.equity at mycaesar.ca. Uh, that will also be in the chat box. Uh, also, while you're here, remember to sign our open letter to remove and replace the Egerton Ryerson statue. It's long past time we removed the statue dedicated to the architect of their residential school system from our campus. Um, you can sign it at www.mycaesar.ca slash statue. Um, and a reminder to check out other Caesar events, services, and campaigns. And please follow on social media 
D2L e-newsletter and YouTube. Um, there's also drag bingo happening tonight at 7 p.m. Uh, so if you'd like to come, please RSVP on our website. Um, and again, a big thank you to our speakers and attendees. And I hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Stay safe, everyone.